Big tobacco lied for generations, causing millions of deaths. Vaping is big tobacco's newest scam. They're using e-cigarettes to get you addicted, but they'll never get me. Show them you're incorruptible. Go to incorruptible.us. Technology Truths, brought to you by GEICO. Technology Truths. Truth. Teenagers can communicate entirely in emojis. How was the birthday party? Pizza slice, kitten, soccer ball, pineapple? Truth. It's so easy to switch and save on car insurance at GEICO.com. What are you talking about? Paperclip, shoulder shrug, high five, wizard hat? What? Geico. 15 minutes could save you 15% or more. Welcome to the Indie Film Hustle Podcast, episode number 344. You don't learn to walk by following rules. You learn by doing and falling over. Richard Branson. Broadcasting from the back alley in Hollywood, it's the Indie Film Hustle Podcast, where we show you how to survive and thrive as an indie filmmaker in the jungles of the film biz. And here's your host, Alex Ferrari. Welcome, my Indie Film Hustlers, to another episode of the Indie Film Hustle Podcast. I am your humble, humble host, Alex Ferrari. Today's show is sponsored by Music Bed. As filmmakers, we're always looking for songs and music for our projects, but it's such a pain in the butt to license and go get music, and it's just been a nightmare. But Musicbed has changed all of that. You can download a single song, get unlimited music with a subscription, or even create a custom song or score from scratch. They already have over 20,000 songs beautifully categorized, and their catalog is growing every single day. If you want to check it out, just go to IndieFilmHustle.com forward slash Musicbed. And because you are Indie Film Hustle Tribe members, you get one month for free to try it out or 20% off a single song purchase. Just enter the promo code Indie Film Hustle. Today's show is also sponsored by Blackmagic's new Pocket Cinema Camera 6K. I am super, super jazzed about this camera. It is a Super 35 sensor and has 13 stops of dynamic range, an EF lens mount, and dual native ISO up to 25,600 for incredible low light performance. It features Blackmagic RAW, a large five inch touchscreen, built in CFast and SD card readers, and USB C expansion port to record directly to an external disc. This is an insane camera guys, and it is a game changer. Oh, and by the way, you also get a copy of DaVinci Resolve Studio to edit, color, do sound for all of your films. If you're going to make a low budget independent film, this camera is the one for you. It's the one I highly, highly recommend. The camera is running at a ridiculous $24.95. That's it. For more information, please head over to Blackmagic's website at www.blackmagicdesign.com. Today on the show, we have filmmaker Gavin Michael Booth. And Gavin made a movie called Last Call, which was has a few things going for it. One, it was shot in one single take. The entire thing was shot in one single take. And it is a, a pretty insane story on how he was able to do it, the planning that goes into it, uh, how many versions he shot of the movie and basically there's no editing in it so it's not a alfred hitchcock or birdman style where you're like hiding the cuts there is no cuts in the movie so i wanted to bring on a filmmaker who has made a a really good looking film which he shot in 8k when we'll talk about why he did that in a minute but it, it was pretty remarkable how he did it and i wanted to kind of dig into how you shoot a one take movie. But the other layers to this cake are that he actually made this film on a micro budget and he's self-distributing the film as well. So we go into his plan to get the movie out there, what he's doing, how he's doing it. And also Gavin is a very accomplished music video director and even created the world's first live film for Bloomhouse in 2015. And we also go into, you know, these backstage stories of what he has to go through sometime to get access, how he hustled his career, how he got started in the career directing music videos, some of the things he did to get backstage that are eh, gray, let's say, uh, <laughs> to get in. I wouldn't call it lying, but, you know, it's, it's a gray area. But we get all into his techniques on how he was able to do that. And it's just a really great conversation 
And uh, I, I just really love talking to him. So without any further ado, please enjoy my conversation with Gavin Michael Booth. I'd like to welcome to the show, Gavin Michael Booth, man. Thank you so much for coming on the show, brother. Happy to be here. Big, big, big fan, longtime listener. I appreciate that, man. I truly appreciate that. I'm I'm a fan of what you do as well, man. I love the style of uh, your work as a director. And we're going to get into your movie, Last Call, in a little bit. But before we even get started, how did you get into this ridiculous business? I, you know, I was like most of us. I was that the the geek in high school that every time there was a chance to make a make a video project instead of submit an essay, I took that route, which quickly started figuring out. Oh, I might I might have a knack for this, and you know, eventually everybody wanted to work in my group because they were going to get a hundred percent if they worked on the video that I created. <laughs> isn't, isn't that isn't that the way it always is? Yeah. Like, yeah, yeah, I'll carry a life for you. I'll carry you know, I'll get some donuts. Well, that's, <laughs> but that's when I learned what it is to be a producer. You're like, oh, just get people that are that are willing willing to to work and get the job done, and and your indie projects come together. So yeah, so I was that kid, and I uh, you know I had big dreams. I grew up in Windsor, Ontario, Canada, which for a point of reference is across the river from Detroit, Michigan. So the mecca of Hollywood, mecca, mecca, the mecca of Hollywood. Yeah, Absolutely. If, if there's what's the uh, Star Wars quote? If there's a bright, if there's a bright center of the galaxy, of the film galaxy, then Windsor, Ontario, is the furthest from. Thank you, you know, for the Star, thank you for the Star Wars yeah. reference. I appreciate that. <laughs> we we had we had Toronto nearby, so that was you know that was still about a four hour drive. So I, you know I I wanted to go to film school in L A. I had my eyes on, uh, you know U C L A. and all these things that I wanted to do, and right. and thought this will be great. But then the international student fees and everything else. Just Ooh. I'm like I'm going to take a year off after high school and work at Walmart, and I'm going to save up money and go to film school. And I ended up pulling a hernia while I was there and not being allowed to work. <laughs> And I was just like, well, maybe I'll start doing wedding videos and some local commercials and, and all that kind of stuff and just have worked for myself ever since. You know, it's been it's coming up on 15, 16, 17 years now that I've been at it. Wow. And I just fell into that. You know, I was, you know, when I was in high school when Kevin Smith, you know, did Clerks and mm-hmm. El Mariachi and all those and just did one of those like, wait. These guys are making movies for twenty five thousand dollars. I I could max out a credit card or two and like, and did oh. did that. You know, made made a couple of those movies. You know, the, the twenty thousand. It, it's it basically ended up being cheaper than film school, but learning way more valuable lessons by mm-hmm. failing by not mm-hmm. having a clue. You know, <laughs> but we survived. We finished a movie. Um, I'm proud of it. Although nobody should ever have to watch it or suffer through it. But uh, you know, didn't know anything about distribution or what the hell to do with you know. Shot on the DVX 100, like remember that baby? Was it the 100 or the 100A, sir? It was the 100. Oh, but so I got, see, that I, got like, uh, yeah. I got Panasonic to sponsor us, and they actually oh. gave us two of the cameras. But it came oh. with the separate anamorphic lens at the time that you had yes. to put on, and mm-hmm. with the attachment, yeah, so, with the attachment yeah. on it, of course. And, and then, then the 100A and B came out. And you're like, why? This is so much easier. <laughs> yeah, I got. The, I was on the 100A, sir, and it was honestly one of the best cameras ever created. It, the image. I, Jeff, that was so beautiful. I shot it. Yeah. So that, that was just it. I had that camera. And then I I, uh, I just did this originally because I wanted to meet bands that I liked and not pay for concert tickets. So I, I made fake Canadian media credentials and would cross the border into Detroit all the time and bring my my DVX and be, oh, I'm here to interview the band. You know, like, you know, oh, you're not on the press list. Oh, well, gee, I'm going to get fired if I go back home and don't have like the, the interview clip for the news tonight. And nine out of ten times it would work. Oh my and then, god, that's brilliant! So I would interview, I would interview the the people, and then say, okay, well, could, you know, can I get like a pass so I could shoot a few songs, the first three songs of the show or whatever? And then most of the time, if you just stick around, nobody says anything. So I just watch all these concerts, and half the time I wasn't even actually filming. I would just point the camera at the stage and watch the show of all these bands that I loved. And I ended up, uh, I was like, then I was like, well, no, I should start filming these. Like maybe I can, maybe I can like show make some little clips and send them to the the record labels maybe somebody will hire me to do a music video and uh one of those bands the first band that fell for my my shtick and and bought into it was third eye blind if you remember that oh my god (laughs) third eye blind you got but i I worked i've worked with them every day to this day like where they have a new album coming out they're touring they're playing the greek theater soon here in la and I'm, i'm gonna gonna be there shooting some stuff for them and it's led to all kind of the first time I ever came to LA was because of Steven from uh, Third Eye Blind was producing a record out here and brought me out to do the DVD that came with the album. So yeah, it was, it was like the best thing I ever did for my career was sneak into something and, and just act like I was supposed to be there, you know? So it was, I did a whole episode on Fake It Till You Make It. And uh, that's a, I've heard of a lot of stories, my friend. That is one, that's a new one for I, me. I met I met my wife the same way. I snuck into a party at the Toronto Film Festival, which she had independently snuck into, and we ended up meeting there. And, and you know, I've been married six years, so it's a it's a strategy that can work. 
It is. It's fascinating. I that is a great story, man. You actually made fake credentials for a fake, I guess, news. Oh no, it was a real news network, but I just made so like it. CNN. So you made like CNN yeah. credentials well, in Canada, the CBC, you know, the, CBC. Uh, the Canadian, and, Canadian version of it. And and it's, since it's another country, they're really not going to check. And it's you're at the thing, and it's like it, it, it has a high probability that it would work. It really I had is. some help. I almost got busted on that particular one, but there was a Detroit radio DJ, Steve Grunwald, that I knew that really like pulled the you know, no 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 he's good he's legit we know him you know and like oh like, donnie brasco wave, style <laughs> yeah wave me in wave me in so that was yeah it's and it's just been one of those adventures where if i trace everything back i'm like man how different would my career in life be if not for that particular moment because i ended up shortly after that like hopping on the tour bus with them and shooting some tour video stuff for them and it led to that opportunity to come to la and shoot this dvd and that opened up doing music videos and you know just this crazy adventure i never thought i'd, I'd be on or had I stayed in Windsor, Ontario, Canada, just trying to make indie films, right. you know, and maybe would, have never moved to LA or done anything more significant. Who knows? And if once you landed three, uh, Third Eye Blind, which was a very big, uh, you know, he, they were a huge band in the '90s, without question, mm-hmm. they were one of those big bands. Then that automatically gave you the credibility, and then the, like, well, if they're working with Third Eye Blind, well, then you know they can help work with us, and it just kind of yeah, snowballs. Definitely. Definitely. And they're one of those bands where they're still, people still love that first record so much. Oh, and, so you know, they, they, still, they still sell 10,000 seats, 15,000 seats a night, you know, like they're out, they're out with Jimmy Eat World this year, like I said, like they're, you know, they're, they're still, still going hard, still have a fan base. But yeah, it definitely opens up more opportunities. And then one management company sees what you do and contact you. And one, one good video, you know, begets another music video opportunity where yeah. a band re- so, you know, especially once YouTube took over oh, and yeah. there was a way for people to see the director and find the contacts for directors. And, um, you know, that's if not for the sort of social media, YouTube, that's that's the other thing that was happening in parallel around the same time. You know, 2003 to 2006 was all the social media boom and making it accessible to find other filmmakers and find bands that needed videos versus just this wasteland of waiting for your phone to possibly ring or only being able to go through the traditional channels of having a music video agent and mm-hmm. then the they work with them and it was a very closed system like it's same similar with film distribution and everything else it the gates were locked to most of us until until you know the indie film revolution and digital video took off yeah and then what, did you have to put your reel on like three quarter inch and send it off or was it well that was more commercial <laughs> yeah. work no, I mean I still had I had I had reels on 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 Betamax and, and reels Oof. lots lots of VHS demos, you know, like let's make the the most beautiful color labels for all of these. Right, right. We'll hand press them at home but they'll look like a machine <laughs> did it. It's fine, you know. <laughs> Uh, oh, the yeah, craziness, yeah. the craziness. And uh, on a side note, if anybody wants to try to break into a or or break into a a, a party <laughs> Uh, or anything along those lines. I mean, it is a little bit of a different world than it was back in the day. I mean, you know, when I used to work at Universal, I would just, I would just wave and pretend I look, I worked there, and people would just let me in. <laughs> uh, this is pre nine eleven, but, uh, but this might still work if you're at Sundance and you want to get into a Sundance party, one of those house parties. All you have to do is just know at least two or three names of some big agents at CAA. Or at <laughs> or, or do a lot of WME. It's always it's always some like pointing. nineteen or twenty year old college uh, intern at the door yep. or volunteer. Yep. And one of the great things about millennials is they're so uh, shy of conflict and then <laughs> they don't want to make a lot of eye contact. Yes. Just be like, I'm supposed to be on the list, and point into the bar or the restaurant or the party and say, Well. I mean, is Jim in there? Like, say the person is is Jim uh, is J- Jim Atwell in there? I'm mm-hmm. here with Jim Atwell. I'm just going to go in and see if Jim's. I'll I'll come back out and find you, but I'm I'm going to go see if Jim's here. He'll he'll come clear everything up, and then just never come back, and they don't they won't care. <laughs> what I used to do is I used to when I was starting out at Sundance, I would walk up to the to the table and I'd be like, yeah uh, yeah Ricky Ricky Smalls please yeah uh, CAA, and they would look on the list and they're like oh. Yeah, Ricky's. Yeah, go in, Mr. Smalls. I'll be like, oh, yes, amazing. thank you so much, and hope that he hadn't just walked in three minutes. Yeah, before I would go, or I would yeah, go earlier it's, it's, because I knew he would never get there earlier. And he, I actually was an acquaintance of a friend who knew him, so we knew that he was there. So, but if not, just get a list of people that you know who are going to be there, and then you can use their names. To get get, getting it. backstage at, at concerts, you take your cell phone, and as you walk close to the security, you start to be like. 
yeah, I'm with the band for at least the next three cities. Yeah, we're going to Dallas tomorrow. We might fly out and do this other thing. But yeah, I'll, yeah, yeah. I'll definitely tell them. I'm about to see them. I'm going to say hi. And, and if you look important, half the time the guy at the gate's not going to be like, I that guy's too important to like interrupt and ask to see oh. his credentials. That's, see- that's, worked, that's worked a handful of times. You know, this is why we have Indie Film Hustle is to teach people <laughs> these kind of tips. These are things that are not on the uh, the show notes. So for anyone listening, these are some bonus, bonus things from two two hustlers who've been able to hustle backstage yeah, and into parties. I, yeah, like I said, the minute the minute I had ever heard of of the site and the podcast, like I've been, I've been a fan from day one because it's always exciting for me to hear – other people's hustle stories or pick up <laughs> tips and like find so many, so many of us are, are kindred spirits in, in the approach right. of what, what we've had to do to, uh, to bust those doors open. Oh God. And it's tough and it's getting <laughs> tougher now, man. Those doors are getting tougher and tougher because there's a lot more people trying to get into that party. And uh, yeah. And, and, and just it, that's, that's a very good analogy of the industry as a whole, you know, literally now that anybody Sodenberg's taught everybody, anybody with us with an oh, iPhone can make every- a movie now. Right. You know, of like, oh, well, Floodgates are open officially. Uh, <laughs> no question. Now, so we've talked a little bit about how you were building your filmmaking career, but is there any tips that you can give people who want to kind of break into music videos or, uh, I mean, you've done some commercials work as well, or just mostly music videos and, and features? A little bit of commercial stuff, uh, you know, mostly sort of regional for all the late night cable stuff that you see for, you know, two for one furniture and suits and things in Detroit. And, yeah, I th- yeah. you know, I've, I've had some interesting, even here in LA, I've done some, uh, worked on some bigger unit stuff like Calvin Klein commercials that Francis Lawrence was directing with Margot Robbie in it. And, um, but directing myself, I've, I've sort of shied away from commercial work. I, I know it's, it's, it's very foolish of me because it's where the money is and that's what would pay my bills while I, while I, uh, work on my indie films. But I just find it so soulless, and I, mm. I, I, even music videos that if I don't jive with the song or the concept that the band's presenting versus something I want to do, I, I do tend to turn things down now. That's the one thing I've had to. The hardest thing to learn is to say no, because technically I can make anything, but if I'm not excited about it, the work suffers, and then I'm just not servicing the client to the best of my abilities. But in terms of getting started with music videos. Find bands that live in your city and your region and just say, don't worry about money up front. Just go offer to make something, collaborate on something, pitch an idea. Something I still do to this day and has worked recently is I sort of shoot stock stock video versions of music videos. I create music videos that the bands that a band wouldn't be in. It's just actors, like a storyline kind of video. Mm-hmm. I go out and shoot it and then find bands to pair it with later. Where I just, oh. you know, like if I have a shoot that's booked on a Monday, whatever, whatever. And we have a 12 hour shoot. I'll book the gear or keep the crew for the next day and ask everybody to do a discount rate. And then we'll shoot just a little like footage. So we literally have no idea what the beat or the rhythm of the song or the length of the song. You're shooting a short film basically like, yeah, Yeah, we shoot a silent short film and then find songs to match it to one of my most successful videos ever. uh, This newer artist, Simmel S Y M L the song, where's my love was one of those videos where it had, that was a little more complicated. It was a band that couldn't pay their bills and, and the footage got recycled into a different video, but similar idea. And what inspired it was just, yeah, go, go and shoot stuff, find people in your, every indie band is in the same position you're in where they can't afford to make a music video and you don't have a name for yourself as a filmmaker. So it's like a match made in heaven to collaborate and just get something on YouTube, get your foot in the door and make something to show I am capable of making a music video Here's what my skill set looks like, and then move forward from there and use that as a sample to try to find more bands. Yeah, it worked for Spike Jones. It did okay. <laughs> yeah, that guy's that guy's made a, a couple music videos we've heard of. Yeah. <laughs> and a, and a few features we've heard of as well. If if you marry a Coppola, things get easier. <laughs> <laughs> things get a lot easier when yeah. that happens. Yeah. Uh, and then also the music video business in general has changed so much with the budgets because I'm sure when the budgets you started off with are not the budget that you're being offered now a lot of times. Yeah. Do you think- now, now I often joke, be like, all right, well, for that budget, I can show up with my iPhone and just, I'll just spin in 360 while you guys play for three minutes and then we'll call it a day. Like, that's about <laughs> all, all, all you can afford. No, it, it is uh, what I still, I probably shouldn't still do music videos because it's so, it's so low pay and everybody, if you have to, all the crews working, the whole industry is just changing a little bit where um, even commercials as they go back to non-union and there's less national television campaigns because everything's mm-hmm. going to internet ads. The whole industry is being hit with that film. As, as it gets cheaper to make films, well, that means that everything else is going to come down rate-wise, unfortunately. Um, 
But what I like about it is practicing new techniques, trying out different cameras, working with uh, DPs or, or grips and editors that I haven't worked with before because it's it's all practicing techniques for the next indie film. Mm -hmm. So when I want to knock out another you know twenty five thousand dollar feature. I know the people to call on or the people that I've been able to give enough music video work to for six months in a row to then call in that favor. And also as a filmmaker, music videos keep me active because generally you you get the gig, you shoot it, and it's released within two to four weeks of production. Whereas your indie film, you make it and there's a real question of will anyone ever Ever's. see this? <laughs> and is it going to be five years by the time it comes out uh, to the public? Or you know, so music videos are, are the instant gratification that keep me uh, keep me excited about about being a creator versus the the dread and self doubt of of living alone with your art until you find an audience. <laughs> Fair enough. Fair enough. Now, tell me about this uh, very remarkable film you you made called Last Call. Last Call, uh, easiest pitch is it's a film that we shot in real time, so it's a single take movie, true single take, no Birdman hidden hidden edits, no uh, Hitchcock's rope where film could only hold so many minutes per minute. <clears throat> shot in a single take, but also it's it's in split screen. So what that means is that there's two camera crews that we're filming simultaneously in two different parts of a city uh, to make up the real time movie. Uh, similar to how Mike Figgis did time code, which mm -hmm. was the four cameras back in the day, but with two and it's the whole movie revolves around a man who's decided to end his life, who calls a suicide hotline, not to be talked out of it. He just doesn't want to die alone because he has no one else to call and he figures the comfort of a stranger will be easier. But due to him already drinking and, and being sort of hopped up on pills, he misdials and ends up connecting with a random stranger who's the night janitor at a college. And when she realizes what he's up to, decides to try to stay on the phone and change the outcome of, of his destiny. So you're actually what they, the actors actually had to act over the telephone for, for the full, the full feature and both camera crews, sound crews couldn't make a single mistake for the, the entire duration of the film. Well, so why one take, man? Like, why did you go down the road? I mean, obviously you're obsessed with them, but other than that. Yeah, yeah. I've, I've done a handful of one-take music videos, and those are easy. I mean, they're always challenging, but at three or four minutes, it's a lot easier. Uh, I had a, a real-time film about a school shooting called Four Shots in Development that we were actually in rehearsal uh, at one point <laughs> in time. We had uh, Mel Gibson's company, Icon Pictures, was going to be our world distributor. We had a million dollar budget. Everything was great and good to go. But due to real life shooting incidents that always shied somebody away from saying, I, I don't know, we're going to get eaten alive when we put this film out. And, and fair enough, the politics of it weren't right. Uh, but ever since that movie not happening, I've been kind of obsessed with it. So when David, my uh, writing partner on this film, who's also the lead actor in it, produced the film with me, David Wilkins, he came to me and said, I have this idea about a guy calling a girl. Like, I feel like a single take would keep it interesting because it's this thing where she can't hang up the phone. She, every word she says that he's either going to hang on or disconnect the phone call that adds this level of tension that I think the single take approach would be interesting, you know? And then I said, well, we'd have to do it split screen because you'd want to see both sides of the phone call. You don't want to see just him or just her. And we just felt that like, yeah, the nature of the story, because uh, I feel like if you're going to do a single take movie, you have to have a reason behind it. It can't just be, look, we did this technical gimmick. It's and, good. And, it's good. Fellas. Yeah. It's a good fellow scene. Yeah. 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 You, you want to have a reason that it, that it adds, adds that tension or keeps the suspense. And we just felt that this was the, the one to do it on. And then to top it off, my composer, Adrian Ellis said, you know what? It started as a joke. He said, I feel like I have to do the music live in a single take because it's just anything I do won't be worthy of what you've accomplished. And I went, wow. that's exactly what you're going to do. <laughs> and he did. We, we, we rented a theater uh, back home in Windsor, Ontario, where I shot the movie. Actually, the theater was donated to us by the same college who let us take over their entire college to shoot the movie. Mm -hmm. And uh, and we we brought in audiences of school kids as a field trip to kind of kind of learn about film scoring, and they got to witness him score live to picture, and uh, you know every, all the musicians play without missing a note, and and that's that's the score that we have in the film. So everybody was really on board with trying to. Every department was like, yeah, we're gonna up our game and figure out how to make this happen. That's insane, dude. So I, I've always you know because I've I've done some long takes in my day, but nothing even remotely close to this. 
<clears throat> and, and I've done the wonder, you know, like a, a scene yeah, that you do yeah. in a wonder, which is great. And it's very economical. And uh, if it's done right, Robert Zemeckis does them beautifully. Spielberg does them beautifully. Okay. Um, there it's, it's a, it's an art. It really is an art, but when you consider doing a 90 minute and I, what's the running time on this? Well, it's shorter than that. We're, we're 77 minutes. Yeah. Fair enough. All right. So 77 is still, we, we were, fair. we were smart where we're like one, we don't want to bore audiences with our indie movie. I, I've never, I all, most of my indie films have always been cut to 85 minutes or under. Cause I just don't think there's ever a reason. Sure. It, it, you know, most movies in general are too long these days in my opinion. Yeah. But we, we wanted to, but also we shot, you know, red, red sponsored the movie and they let us take out two of their helium cameras. So we did shoot in 8K, so we had the best resolution, the best ability to reframe. So there's also a limit of how much space you can hold on their one terabyte cards. Right. So had we gone over, I think, 80 minutes or 79 minutes, we would have not got the film. We would have run out of space. All yeah. right. So first of all, what kind of prep do you need to make something like this work? Because you just said you have two film crews. And mm -hmm. you as a director, basically just, you're basically shooting a play essentially. Cause you're just kind of like, yes. you organize everybody, you tell everybody what to do. The actors are pretty much on their own for those 70 some minutes. You can't stop and redirect their performances. Let's take a step by step first on the technical aspect. Sure. What does it take to do this? Um, first was finding, finding locations. I knew going back home would be, would be the easiest way to do it. Making films in LA is expensive. There's no way around. <laughs> uh, so going back home to Canada, to Windsor, where I've had a lot of, I mean, I wouldn't have a film career without that city being so gracious to me. All of our catering was sponsored, had amazing deals on hotels for out of town cast and crew. Like I said, a college basically gave us the keys and allowed us to come in for 20 days of rehearsal and shooting, would let us leave lights up so that we didn't have to redress every night. So we kind of had, while the actors were rehearsing for 10 days, uh, we our gaffer and crew could be pre-lighting. And what we would do is we would film every rehearsal so we mm -hmm. could put a rough assembly together every night. We would just shoot at uh, regular HD at 1080 on the cameras and we could slap together a rough preview and then the team would watch it every night and make lighting adjustments, performance adjustments for the actors, sound wow. adjustments, would have those 10 days of, of tech and performance rehearsal and then we had four days to shoot the movie. So it was, it was shot at night so our goal was at um, I think midnight was our start date or start time. We would roll the whole thing, have lunch roll the whole thing again. So our goal was to get eight complete takes and then choose the one that was the film. We ended up with five complete takes, one disaster take, and two other times where we just said, we're not ready to go again, so let's not exhaust ourselves. Let's come back tomorrow and just try harder tomorrow. What was the disaster take? What, was, what made it the disaster take? I'm just curious. Uh, I have a clip on my Instagram. It's it's uh, because, because I knew that somebody eventually is going to try to call us out and say that we didn't truly shoot it in a single take and we must have hidden cuts. Uh, I had multiple GoPros rigged to each camera rig so that we could, we could document the entire thing. And uh, my camera assistant who was do, uh, running all the behind-the-scenes stuff had – rigged the GoPro just a little higher. I had an easy, like, so I camera operated one side of it. My, my DP Seth, mm -hmm. um, did the other, but we had easy rigs, but the clearance that I had leaving a bar at the beginning was like maybe an inch mm -hmm. and the GoPro was rigged slightly higher than that. So about nine minutes into a take, I'm going to leave the bar and the GoPro just catches it. So there, there's me screaming the F word as loud as I can that, that I, that I, uh, I, put up on, on Instagram because I just ultimately it becomes a very funny moment, you know, like, <laughs> not at the moment, yeah. but afterwards, no, 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 in the moment it's like, ah, oh. yeah. Cause that just drains everyone's energy and you're like, Oh, we got to start over. And, and the reset process was, was still Brutal. tedious. But what, what worked out in my home city is the college, the bar and the apartment. Those are our three main sets. We're all within like a two or three city block radius of each other. So we could base camp at one location. Originally we were going to use, um, like a, an actual call center, but it was on the other side of the city. And if we were driving 15 miles between locations to, cause what we would do for rehearsal is we would rehearse sort of the one character, the, the woman, the janitor, uh, played by Sarah Booth. We would rehearse her side for six hours on a day. And then we would move over to the apartment and the bar and rehearse his side of the story. And we would do that back and forth until we kind of had it 
down pat and then we would actually split off into the two crews and and start figuring out how long it was going to take and, and we just you know we're, we're working on a very small self-financed indie budget so we we those were the days we had there was no way to add an extra day if we needed it we just we had to get it in those 14 days uh but sometimes just setting those restrictions you know most one take music videos i have it's like show up that morning figure it out and we have to have it shot by the end of a 12-hour day Mm -hmm. um so the pressure the pressure i'm used to but uh it was not to say without its its challenges (laughs) so as far so it was just a constant it was just rehearsing, 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 rehearsing. Which you were just beating it down until you finally felt in a place that you were comfortable enough to let go. Well, we ended up rewriting the whole script like uh, about two days before we started the actual filming take. So about day eight of rehearsal, because we would watch the it's it's history. It, the movie would work as a traditional movie with cuts and back and forth. But that's the one thing you have to keep in mind with the real time film is like, you are not going to be able to change anything in post I know. or any other film usually gets saved in editing. Yeah. Just a cut. You're Here, like, a cut there, yeah. yeah. Or just that take instead of this take. Right. And, you build oh, the performance. You know, we can cut this whole scene out or we can rearrange these scenes or lines or whatever, whatever we can extend this moment. And we knew that we didn't have any of that. And we just started watching the rehearsals. And by about day four, I just knew in my gut, I'm like, Originally, I, I don't want to give too much away about the plot, but you know, originally it was uh, him trying to engage her and keep her on the phone because he didn't want to be alone. And I just, I was like, she would just hang up the phone and go back to cleaning. She's got her own stuff going on in her life that comes up in the film, and this crisis where her her son hasn't come home, but she can't leave her job because she's already on thin ice, and uh, the ba- the babysitter's getting frustrated. And we're just like, she's got her own stuff. She would just hang up. I said, this movie has to be about her and her wanting and making the decision to stay on the phone with him and trying to change. But it meant uh, like a page one rewrite to go through and change. So David, uh, who again is already in the middle of rehearsing, acting for the film and and in the thick of producing it with me, he and I spent an all nighter and just cranked out a new draft that uh, he and Sarah, the actress had to, had to memorize and everybody had to make all the, changes to to camera movement and 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 know the new sound cues and everything and our sound guys were we didn't have boom operators because there was just no space to put a boom mic Mm -hmm. or you know we're dealing with a college with a bunch of glass windows and glass doors and reflections everywhere the the camera reflections mic reflections. so we decided to just double lav uh both of the actors so they had two two lav mics per actor and that way if one fell off or one got distorted we would hopefully have the other one and to their credit we didn't have to do a single line of adr in uh in post-production and which, that was, was, which is insane and yeah. I'm, I'm fascinated with the process that you're going through now with the actors sure they memorized the script but you know they didn't hit it perfectly so things you loosened up i mean i'm assuming they didn't hit it perfectly yeah. so they loosened it's, things up here and there it's pretty spot on, but yeah, they definitely, um, we always had those, those markers because a lot of it is based on, okay, he's, he's going to call it here. You'll, you'll be at this point. Uh, but because she was the janitor in the college, we said, listen, if he hasn't called, put the mop down, pick up this and go on to do this. Just, just act like you're, you're in this, you're actually a janitor, you know, just keep finding tasks and things to do. And we do have a couple things in, in the take that we chose, which is our best take, there's a couple times where he tries to dial and something doesn't connect and he's got to hang up the phone and try again. So that was our only thing in post where we were like, well, what if we just like have it that you called the wrong number or called and hesitated and hang up and it feels like a character choice. We just, we work those sort of mistakes into the story of the film. Uh, I mean, honestly, we got, we got really lucky. It could have, it's one of those things where you, you, you finish the project and you reflect on it and you're like, I don't even know how or why, how we accomplished it or why we chose to put ourselves through that. (laughs) I've been there. (laughs) Would it have changed the movie if we had a hidden cut every 10 minutes? Like for, for really for an audience perspective, you know, absolutely not. Yeah. But (laughs) we just, we were determined to do it and and it worked thankfully, you know, but we knew we, we had told like, you know, our private investors, we had said, you know, there's there's a chance that this film doesn't turn out the way it's supposed to, and we've got to make a more traditional version of it or or whatever. But we managed to manage to pull it off. No, it's yeah. This is the psychotic thing that we are as filmmakers. It's just like at the end of the day, Birdman. Really, could we could we pull a Birdman on it? Would it really change the experience? No, but I would argue that it would change the energy of the whole movie. 
I think so. I mean, Birdman, <clears throat> Birdman had to have cuts. I mean, oh, just, no, just the just scope. The scope. I mean, especially because they change from day to night and things like that yeah, in the story. You know, it's, it's, it's great. But I think, yeah. I, I but I mean, what what are we as indie filmmakers if we're not going to be ambitious and try to do things that that not everybody's doing? Like, how are you ever going to stand out making a dramatic film about a Another guy at wit's end calling a trying to call a helpline. Like we're not the first people to tell the story. We're not gonna be no. the last people to tell the story. What can we do to set ourselves apart and try to get some attention to our careers as well as make a movie that we really believe in that audiences will enjoy? Now do you um when when you're done so you're shooting the first day, you shoot the first take, you have lunch. During lunch, are you watching that to make adjustments or are you not? Uh, yep. Yeah, most of the time I would, I would load it, just load it up into premiere, do a rough version of the split screen. Cause the split screen actually also, uh, rotates through the film from sort mm-hmm. of a horizontal split to vertical split at different moments. So the camera men need to know where to, where to change that up to, but we would just do a very sloppy version of it so we could, we could watch it. But yeah, we try to watch it on the lunch break. Cause our, our lunch breaks were like a couple hours. Cause what happens, uh, where we were filming downtown, there's a very busy, bar strip it's kind of like tijuana of the north where all the uh, uh <laughs> underage americans at 19 and 20 can come over and drink oh, that's so genius. there's a there's a, there's a period of around like 1 a.m to 3 a.m where it just gets very sloppy and loud and noisy and then and then because we didn't have permits to close streets and things we were sort of just out in the wild and didn't have full control of everything so we we took feeling. an extended yeah we took an extended <laughs> lunch because we we knew it would help avoid some uh, some problematic people or people trying to like stick their face in the in the camera as it goes by not to mention when you're walking by like a $60,000 camera rig you don't want to be doing it at 2 in the morning in a downtown somewhere right um, the, you know the chances of theft or theft or uh, somebody just being an idiot and trying to break it are are much higher than but wait, during but wait, regular business hours. But wait a minute. But in Canada, there's there is no crime. Everything's perfect. <laughs> um, everyone's super sweet, super nice. Uh, there are no bad people there. That's just generally the marketing. Except uh, moms against. Well, well the, you guys did have to form Moms Against Canada. I saw it documented it, is, in the South it, Park movie, right? You know. Oh you know. God, that was genius. <laughs> yes, that was Blame a great. Canada. Yeah. <clears throat> Blame Canada. Absolutely. Blame Canada. Yeah. Oh, I, as, a, as a Canadian, I saw that movie in uh, New York with some friends on opening weekend and just yeah. like I've never laughed harder in my entire life because I had no idea I was walking into a South Park movie where they were going to like <laughs> rip on Canada for 90 minutes. <laughs> By the way, if anyone has not seen the South Park movie, it's uh, it's one to watch. <laughs> the Oscar nominated South Park movie. <laughs> Robin Williams <laughs> sung Blame Canada on the Oscars that year. I'll never yes. forget it. It was it's just things where you're like this, this shouldn't be happening but here we are yeah. <laughs> now as a director what is some of the biggest challenges of shooting a one take you know is it the actors is it the crew is it the lack of control is it the lack of any sort of control almost like what is what's the the biggest challenge you see uh i mean the biggest challenge i had was i was i was not intended to be the camera operator of one side that was thrown at me uh like the last day before we started shooting because we had a camera operator that is a wonderful camera operator. Just couldn't hit because the camera operators were also their own focus pullers. Oh. We were using the uh, we were using the uh, the nucleus M uh, handles from Tilta mm-hmm. uh, because again, adding another body with another wireless control mm-hmm. that could potentially yeah. go wrong. <clears throat> another set of shadows and people to avoid getting in and out of vehicles or or into elevators. And we just wanted to eliminate and strip the crew down as much as possible. Uh, that was thrown at me the night before we started. So I, I had gone from, I, I, I've DP'd many music videos. I've been my own cinematographer on projects. I've stepped away from that the last five or six years and always hired DPs. So suddenly mm-hmm. it was like, you're, you're back in the fray, go for it. But I will say my uh, experience shooting tour videos for bands and concert videos and things really came into play because that's a lot of running gun of like, got to nail it every moment can't possibly like mess up the focus while you're running right. around. Uh, so that, that was the biggest personal challenge, but I, the scare, the scariest thing is just, are, are we going to get it? Cause there's just too many variables at play. Um, batteries that could go signals yeah. that could be lost. Um, you know, the tripping, tripping downstairs. And I, I thought the biggest thing would be technical. I was not concerned about the actors, David, uh, who stars in it and wrote it, David comes from like a comedy background, but he was really looking to do something more dramatic. And, and at first it's kind of like, I, you know, I, I, I had like, can, can he do it? Is he going to be able to stretch himself that far? 
Um, you know, he's he's the guy that won the Doritos Super Bowl commercial for for the funny commercial, the Time Machine that's, Doritos commercial. That's where I recognize. That's yeah. where I recognized him from. Be- because it's four years later and it plays on TV every single day. Like it's Doritos' most popular commercial still. It's great. It's a great um, commercial. It's a great commercial. So yeah. So but that was, and then we were going to cast a different. We we had access to uh, a t- uh, like legit current TV star that was really interested in doing the project, but. As we were researching the technical aspects of the film, we kept having to, okay, we're going to push back a month. We're going to push back a month until we have it right. And she ended up going back to her uh, NBC show and wasn't able to, to do the project anymore. So we, we approached Sarah Booth, who's, who's my wife, and I thought, well, if I know anybody that can do theater, I had seen her in a production of Blackbird that she did in Toronto in 2012 – like, was it two thousand? Sorry, more like mm-hmm. two thousand fifteen. Uh, Blackbird is a is a one act play. It's rapid fire dialogue for two hours and very intense. Uh, the the story is dark and intense. And it's just two actors on stage, no scene breaks, no act breaks, nothing, just start to finish. I thought, well, she can do this. I know that I can trust her. So that that was the biggest thing for me. Once once I trusted both actors. And saw a couple of rehearsals and knew that they were good to go. I knew we could make all the technical come together and work. That's How, always that's always the challenge of like hiding hiding every light cable, um, you mm-hmm. know, hiding every reflector, masking every door that's got a, at the college every door that's got a, a furnace behind it or something that that's causing all the sound issues. You know, making sure the the AC unit is turned off in every single classroom that we're going to wander in and out of. And, um, it the technical side of it was the bigger challenge for, for me. How Ask about the, the actors? I'll have a different story. Yeah. <laughs> but how about the, the timing? Because you didn't just shoot one, one take movie. You shot mm-hmm. two one take movies basically. Cause yes. one take is like, if you're just using one camera and just following people around, that's a different conversation, but you had to coordinate basically two, Mm-hmm. complete movies like figures this movie they had to they had to do four um, it works it works for i mean and their their movie's interesting because time you know i'm obsessed with time code but you know it was it was largely improv yeah and they got to do 16 full run throughs of it over 16 days uh so they were able to sort of develop and it was a little looser that you know the thing that was coordinated was if you remember it's on a day that there's a couple earthquakes in los angeles right, right. so the camera operators all had to know it exactly in sync when to when to shake the camera and everybody do the yeah. star trek thing where they bounce around and pretend it was basically a time but that was that's just like a timing cue that you could do so is that kind of yeah. what you did yeah it, well i mean the advantage we have is that they are largely on the phone for the majority of the movie mm-hmm. so once once they call and start their conversation together, everyone's locked into sort of the same schedule or, or time frame. It's when they when they hang up or disconnect or have moments that they're not together on the phone that were sort of the wild card moments. Or for, you know, David's character, Scott leaves, starts in a bar and leaves and walks to the to his apartment building and gets in the lobby in the elevator. And we had no idea what that was going to take every night. Was that going to be a two minute walk? Was it going to, was it going to hit red lights and have to wait to cross the street? Was it going to be four minutes? Was the elevator mm-hmm. going to arrive as soon as he pushed the button? Were we going to wait in the lobby for a minute? Uh, just all, all those variables we didn't know. So it was, it, some of it was just a, a bit of a, you know, hold your breath and, and hope for the best on each take. And people could argue that, you know, shooting a one take movie is a lot cheaper than shooting a traditional movie. <laughs> I mean, it's just one take. It's 90 minutes. It's that's all it is. That's really no. So can you talk a little bit about that myth or, or confirm that, or if there's a happy medium between the myth and the truth? I hear that conversation a lot with music. Well, we'll do a one take thing. Like that's, that's easier. I'm like, well, you end up spending, if if you have a 12 hour shoot day on average for a music video, (laughs) if you're doing a one take video, you're probably going to spend 11 hours rehearsing and trying to get everything ready and then one hour. So you're still there with the same amount of crew, the same amount of gear, the same amount of time, you know, like we, we, we essentially had a 14 day production, which is all, almost a little luxurious for independent film where most people it's, try to get it in 10, 11 or 12 days. You know, I admire those people. I'm, I, mm-hmm. I'm the guy that like, I've been very fortunate that even in the indie world, I've had uh, 20 or 21 days to shoot. To like shoot features. The mad, the madness, the madness. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but the, like 
I do, I do, I do have a uh, indie feature coming up where we're going to shoot it in like ten days, and so I'm going to have that challenge. But you know, we we technically had more days to rehearse and prep than than most. But no, it, it costs you the same because you know we've got to rent the cameras for that whole amount of time. If if you know if there was a way where we could have rehearsed and then brought the cameras in just for a couple of days, you know, things like that, like we could have to shot with other cameras, yeah, you know, like a cheaper DVX 100A, uh, yeah, for example. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, the smart the smart move would have been using like a. Uh, a Sony A7S or a, right. a, a GH5 or something that that didn't have the weight, but because we had the deal with Red and you know, so we just had to rent the lenses and rent the support gear. Um, but yeah, it, it, it definitely made for. But if we had to rent all of that stuff, like any traditional indie filmmaker would do, it would have cost the same to shoot a 14-day movie shot traditionally or a one-take movie where even if we'd only shot for one day and rehearsed for 13, it would have cost the same. But would you are can the argument be made that if you're going to shoot a one day a one take movie, and it's it's a, a real traditional one take movie, not like what mm-hmm. you did, which is basically two movies sunk together with yeah. two film crews, you could maybe shoot it in a, if you if you rehearse it a bunch and stuff. But you also had a you had a benefit too because you had a lot of locations that you had basically access to for for free. Absolutely, during that, that time to beat that it up, killed our, that would have killed our budget if we, and you, and, and I'm, I'm also at a point too, where like, I do like to, I mean, everybody's still working for reduced rates, but we did want to spend enough with our budget or have enough of a budget that we could pay everybody a, a day rate for being there versus calling mm-hmm. in just favors. You know, sometimes again, sometimes, if it's a short film, uh, I don't believe in spending a lot of money on short films cause there's not a financial return from them. And I think there's a general consensus among, among most of my friends that are actors or crew people that, Hey, we're all making short films to get ourselves noticed to practice our craft. Like real I don't mind real, donating right. some days here and there or working on a super reduced rate. But when it comes to a feature where, you know, ultimately the producers are are aiming at selling it and making some money off of it, well then they should pay everybody up front that like of course we offer everybody a back end percentage deal. There's always <laughs> right. that lottery ticket that, you know, it really is a lottery ticket. Like it every once in a while it's gonna pay off. Paranormal activity guys made a bundle. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> I know. I, I I worked on a project with the Blumhouse guys. I'm just always like, man, some of these movies must the back ends must just be bonkers, you know. Right, because they got uh, a great cast of but but they actually do all make obscene amounts of money. Like even uh the what's the ma ma that just opened or whatever the, you oh, know, the it was, it 18, was cu- eighteen million on a five million dollar budget and you're like oh that's gonna just keep going and going you know oh no that that's the sweetest deal ever in Hollywood that was that was the one you know what I've in talking about the the any of the fear or worries or stress of making last call I had done a project for Blumhouse we did the world's first live movie. So it was actually broadcast live. We used, it was 2015, so we used Periscope, like the live streaming platform, yes. uh, before Facebook video or Facebook Live came along and everybody goes, what's Periscope? Yeah, um, exactly. But at the time, we, we did a movie where essentially the, uh, a serial killer was using his iPhone to broadcast his murders. Sort of, and, and we approached it like a total War of the Worlds thing, where we didn't tell the audience what they were watching was a movie. We just let everyone assume that this this feed they tuned into was live. Mm-hmm. So it was a mass killer talking to the camera and essentially taunting the police and the audience, saying it was called Fifteen. Said, "If you have fifteen minutes to figure out where I am, or I'm going to kill again." And then he proceeds to start stalking a house. Very Michael Myers, like looking in the window of these two young girls getting ready for a Halloween party. We did it on on Devil's Night on October 30th or October 29th, somewhere around there. And everybody, our our actor was the camera operator that could read all of the comments coming in in real time, and then and then also interact with the audience. So if like some username was like Superman three two five says, oh this is this is fake. He could go, oh yeah, Superman three two five. I'll come kill your family next. And it's like, what? This isn't like this is this isn't rehearsed. This is happening live. How so did that, how did do how did do? We we had a lot of viewers and got a lot of attention from it. It was it was really fun to have Blumhouse's trust to create that project under their brand because I I knew I could do it and get a couple thousand people to watch through my own like. Facebook and Twitter and Periscope, but I'm like, man, they're the kings of of found footage and all these low budget. I'm like, if I can get them on board, and then and not only just having them on board to have their audience, uh, it was beneficial because they're also great at developing horror stories and having their insights and ways to do it and access to casts and, and other things. But that was the scariest moment of my life because we would rehearse it on sort of like a closed uh, Periscope feed where you can invite just 
the 10 people that are the department heads to watch. And there was a three to six second delay. So if the actor said something six seconds later, it showed up in the feed. Mm -hmm. But when we broadcast live and tens of thousands of people or whatever, start tuning in or thousands of people start tuning in, um, the delay went to a minute, a minute and a half or somewhere. But there were a lot of things that we had planned on where, okay, I bang on the window here. This actor knows to leave this room and start, start their part of the story. This, this audio cue, I've got, uh, I've got a sound effects thing and a PA system in the neighboring yard with police sirens and other things. But all of a sudden, nobody knew when the cues were supposed to happen because we're watching, we're watching the actor enter the house. And then on our Periscope feed, a minute and a half later, it's, it's showing up. So everything, I was suddenly like crawling, like army style, like having to squat and crawl around front yards and like, you know, crawl, crawl into the house where the set is and try to like give new cues and, and keep it all going while it's happening live where there was no way to stop, restart. And then I always joke, the scariest thing is trusting an AT&T phone signal in LA to not, you know, it was only a 25, like 20, 25 minute project. It was a short film, but trusting, you know, trusting any phone call in LA to last more than three minutes is, uh, <laughs> is, is a real leap of faith. Yeah. It seems like you've, uh, you've carved out a little niche for yourself as a director, as a psychotic who likes to do these kind of one take, <laughs> one take. I do, like, I do like traditional film too, but uh, I mean, this, <laughs> this is the, it's the, for me, it's always the fun stuff of, of what can we do that we haven't done before. So everybody's, Everyone's really on their toes all the time and trying to like Ugh. anything you have to invent or create new ways to figure out how to do it. That's the stuff that generally excites me the most. Do you see yourself in 30 years sitting on a set when you're 60 going, all right, we're going to do this one take hologram shot. All right, let's do this. And we're going to we're gonna do it for only four hours this time. <laughs> Holo- yeah, directing hologram <laughs> actors. That's going to it's going to happen. We're so we're so close to that with like motion capture and bringing actors we're going back to the holodeck from, from dude. the dead. You know? We're going yeah. to the holodeck. That's yeah. where that's the end. That's the end game is the holodeck. I mean, they technically have that, right? You see, like the like the previs or things of like Gareth Edwards on Rogue One, for example, and he's holding like he's like, okay, I'll move this virtual camera here, but near real time and almost finished render, he can but see it, what's happening. You know? But until you can physically walk into a room like on Star Trek and yeah. live and breathe, and and even to a certain extent, even eventually touch, I don't know how that technology will work. Yeah, but interact with that environment that you're have in. You been, have you been to the VR experience of the Void? I've Glendale? heard of it. I've heard of it. As a Star Wars fan, my friend, you need to go. You get to be a stormtrooper, and it's a physical Stop space it. that you walk through. So there are walls and levers that you pull. That must just be like a piece of wood, but it is like fully rendered in CG as you walk around. And you go to like Darth Vader's planet Mustafar, and they've got the heat cranked through heat lamps and the smell of like burning paint paper in the air so it feels like the molten lava is burning and bubbling all around you and i'm sorry it's called the void uh, sir it's the, the void? void yeah the it's, void. At the, it's at the glendale galleria and they have a ghostbusters one and a wreck it ralph one but uh uh that, any, that, you want to do that i'll meet you there i'm always <laughs> going to go back and do that experience and so it's <laughs> It's it. It was the next level where I went. Oh, this is where VR and video games are going. And like, yeah. let's say figure out how to make a home version of this. We're it's smell-o-vision. Then we're only one step away. <laughs> yeah, then we're one step away from the hollow deck. The hollow deck with smell vision. <laughs> Got it. Got it. <laughs> it's gonna, it's going to be App, Apple's going to invent contact lenses, right? Like the true iPhone, and then <laughs> the true be, I. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. And then everything will be then everything and then we'll have to all figure out new ways to make I don't know if you've done any virtual reality filmmaking yet. I'm just Not starting yet. to dabble in it, but it's a it's a whole other world where I don't really feel like anyone's truly figured out how to do narrative stuff with it and really make yeah, it exciting. Was it? Was but it Justin Linda did that or it was so I forgot the director who did that short film. We had it we had a we've had a couple of people from Didn't VR Rodriguez do one? Not not a VR. He did a, oh, no, he did that thing with John Malkovich that won't be seen for a hundred years. That gets put in into the vault for for that liquor company. You ever saw that one? Oh, he shot an entire short film yeah. for a liquor company. He was hired to do it, and it stars John Malkovich and a few other mm-hmm. people. And it's locked away in a vault, and it will be released in the time capsule in a hundred years. And it was a Weird. sci-fi short. And it was a sci- it was paid for by by the the the. Uh, the liquor company. So it was like some sort of, you know, tequila or something I, like that. And then say years seems a little like nobody's going to remember this happened. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, you know, someone's going to find that and they're going to go, what, who's this John? What Malkovich? is this? Oh, you mean that company that went bankrupt in 2021, you know, <laughs> <laughs> exactly. 
I it hope it gets like re- smart marketing. I, I hope it gets released before then. Uh, now, as far as smart marketing and distribution, <laughs> how do you? Uh, how are you guys getting this out there? Is it out there already? What's what's the what's the plan? It's just it's on the festival circuit right now. Um, I mean, obviously this podcast will air later, but we're about to come up to our dances with films premiere here in yeah. LA at the Chinese Theater. Nice. Um, we 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 actually weren't going to. So so here's our strategy. I, like many of us, have been through the ringer where you sell your film to a big company. No. And like, you know, my film, The Scare House, played all over the globe. It played theatrically in Asia and the Philippines, and it's on VOD everywhere. It's on Blu-ray all over the place. It's but here. One, you can but, watch but it one, on Showtime. Long but one story question, short. But one question, but one question I have to ask you, how do you enjoy your golden toilet that you, that you go to the bathroom on every day? <laughs> Obviously – Buckets of money came in from this deal. It has to make sense, no? Well, well, it's amazing, right? Because, you know, we went and then made Last Call next, and people go, he must be hiding all that money. How is he making another – you know, it, it's that it's that deal where as the producer, you have to deal with everybody's uh, Assumption. disappointment and, and wrongful expectations because we have not seen one single – Penny. Wow. Because we all know that system, the endless expenses, the Oh, you didn't cap the exp- you didn't you, you didn't cap the expenses? When at the time when you made a film in Canada, we had we have wonderful grant systems, Telefilm Canada and tax credit systems, but at the time you had to have a distributor attached before you went to camera. That's one of the stipulations of who they give money to. But that gives the dis- distribution companies the advantage of handing you a contract where it's like you sign this or you don't get to make your movie. So and, and what was it, that distribution company? Yeah, we'll uh we'll, we'll, we'll keep we'll that quiet privately. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I do I do give you credit. You sh- shouted out a few um independent distribution companies in the past. When I I listened to one of your podcasts about distribution and Michael Ingram at Parade Deck Films, mm-hmm. he actually came in and uh, helped us sell some of the territories and things that that were not exploited, so that we could actually start to like at least make back some of the investment money on the film. Mm-hmm. But long story short, we we made last call for a micro budget with the goal of like let's just make something small enough that we can own the IP forever and cut out the middleman. So I've actually launched my own distribution company called Fu Entertainment, which stands oh. for Filmmakers Unite, <laughs> and. Uh, <laughs> If That's nobody great. else will support us, we'll stand together united and say F you to the industry. That's and I just fantastic. figured, you know, because we made it for such a low amount of money, we'll be able to get in the green rather quickly with a couple sales to places that I've had films placed in the past. Mm-hmm. And and we weren't going to do a festival run at all because we we're like, that's not the goal. We don't because you usually go to a festival to try to seek a, sure. a, a traditional distribution company. And not to say that there aren't people – in this new digital world, figuring out ways to not rip off people like the old there guard. There, there, I've had a few of them. People. Yeah, it's um, they exist. We just wanted to do something on our own. But then uh, we had a festival in Wisconsin, the Beloit International Film Festival, of all places. It was like your film sounds really fascinating. Would you submit? And we're like, why not? I mean, and everyone's like, why aren't you doing Sundance for a premiere? It's like, well, because the realistic expectations of waiting an entire year and then getting a rejection letter doesn't sound very exciting to me. That's know? exactly what yeah. I did with on the corner of Eagle and Desire. I waited a year for Sundance because yeah, I, it was a I've movie about Sundance. <laughs> and I would think, you know, you <laughs> think there might, this is the best shot I'm going to get. Yep. And I got that rejection letter and I did a whole episode called, I got rejected. That, from should, be, that should be the poster. That should be the poster of the movie, the rejection letter. Yeah. It should be the official rejection by Sundance Film Festival. I should put that on the po- Laurels with official rejection, Sundance it's, Film Festival. It's funny that you say that. I I have that currently. <laughs> uh, I mean, I'll, I'll call it up while we're talking. So yeah, so we, we got invited to this festival. We, we won a best feature award there. And then uh, Dancing with Films, I'm an alum. I had a short film there last year. I've, I've helped out on a few other films that have played there. And we just thought, well, I don't know. Maybe we'll give it a festival, right? Because you know, most people that saw the film suddenly went, you know what? This this is a festival movie. It this is, is the it, kind it, of thing it, that mm-hmm. other that. filmmakers will love. And we're like, well, then that'll be that'll be great. So you know what? what you, you're very familiar with the festival circuit. When you do the festival circuit, you have to make postcards that you put out in the lobby. Mm. And everything's like trying to like just – anything to get people interested in seeing your movie. If you're like me, you appreciate everyone's effort, but you look at that, that sea of postcards and you go, I don't no. care. Like, I don't know. 
I don't know who this is. I don't know who these actors are. And if the art's not a thousand percent captivating, it's going to be forgotten. So we thought we went with a, a little less traditional postcard this year that just says placeholder. Wow. Uh, last call poster goes here, but we put fake laurels on there. So one of, one of them is, uh, is can never submit, never submitted. Yes. Uh, official rejection. Oh. That's true. That's actually true. Um, Missed deadline for Sundance oh, for this year. Uh, I'm going to steal. I'm stealing all of that. I'm sorry. I don't know. If, I don't know if you'll get this one. Crying, crying Monkey Award co- coveted. It's, uh, crying Monkey Award. It's from uh, Tropic Thunder when they referenced that in one of the. Uh, this one's my favorite. I stole this from a friend. Everyone, everything looks official with laurels. <laughs> <laughs> and then this one, winner of the Beloit International Festival. This one's real. <laughs> so we did that, but what we did on the back of the postcard. <laughs> idea was to you know just do something nice but then on the back we have this this whole write-up that says like look you're probably thinking filmmakers without a poster don't know what they're doing but we can't explain our movie in a poster this is what we did a single take movie yada yada and it goes all the way through and says but i bet you're probably at least curious now and like it has the website so that's actually quite brilliant that's the best some of the best marketing i've seen for a film festival I mean, it, it goes back to I'm I'm a huge fan of uh, Dan Mervish and the Slam Dance Festival. You know, oh yeah, and, and Dan, his, of course. With, 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 yeah, with his film uh, uh, Omaha or Oma, where where he mm-hmm. he went he did the sandwich board sign and went city to city and like just you know booked a theater and, and and invited people in one one at a time. And I'm a huge fan of doing whatever you can in the industry because it's not good enough to make a film that everybody likes you have to make sure that it makes an impact somehow or you get the word out there. That's, and you see it all the time at festivals. Like festivals are wonder. I love festivals for meeting other filmmakers because you really do meet like your future collaborators or you find that next person where you're like, Oh man, I want to work with you. I want to direct something that you've written or vice versa, whatever it is. Um, that's always going to be a great thing about film festivals. Um, but you also just see a lot of sadness and desperation and people that, you know, I, I feel blessed to have sort of a, a promotion marketing brain somewhere mm-hmm. in me. Cause a lot of people, if you're just the creative and, and can make a beautiful product, it's not enough anymore. Unless you have the money to pay someone else to do all that for you, you have to be inventive and find ways to get, to get your film out there. No, no question, man. Well, that, first of all, I'm going to steal all of those because that's fantastic. That is fantastic. I'm sure somebody out there right now is going to do that. I was doing that back in 05 where, where I went for my festival and I, with my shorts broken, I actually, I got into like 150, 200, something like that festivals, Yeah. but I got rejected from all the big boys and I, and I put, um, officially visiting Sundance <laughs> Film Festival, officially visiting Toronto, where I actually went with my film there. And then if you click on the laurels, there's pictures of me with celebrities and hanging out in Toronto. Amazing. Hanging Amazing. <laughs> now, Toronto's, I'm ask- Toronto's a very good festival. And that was the same thing. Everyone in Canada is like, put it in TIFF. I'm like, it doesn't work like that. They're not- oh, you're Canadian. Automatic. It's yeah, just an automatic. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's like it doesn't work like that. And again, I didn't want to wait till September. I'm like, we submitted and who knows? If they, if they say yes, awesome. But, you know, a lot of festivals are very big on – we, it has to be a world premiere. It's like, well, it can't be a world premiere everywhere. So, right. So you know, then, pick, you, pick, then you get into, battles. you get, then you get into North American premiere, then you get into California premiere, then you get into yeah. like these ridiculous premieres. So I would, you know, I would say one of the big things I think is, you know, opportunities like this. If you listen to podcasts about filmmaking, mm-hmm. call, call them up. I called you up and said, Hey, I, I have something I think would be interesting to talk about. Like you can sit at your keyboard now and find anyone on social media and find a way to contact them. Uh, we did hire a publicist for this festival premiere in LA. This is my first feature premiering in LA ever. I've mm-hmm. had shorts here. I've had films that have played theatrical here, but we've never had like a premiere event for something. So we thought, you know what? Uh, you know, my, and my wife's in the film too. So her acting career is going great. I'm guest stars on television and things, but mm-hmm. I really think more so than the movie itself, the acting performances in last call are phenomenal because if of you want to see people that like can't, edit their performances or have any ADR, you know, it's, it, they, they did a wonderful job. So we just thought, let's try to do, let's, let's blend traditional and non-traditional, like let's get a publicist and she, she's wonderful. Uh, but you know, let, let's not also just rely on that alone. Mm-hmm. Um, she, she had actually recommended your podcast. So there are people oh, in, wow. the, in the public industry. They're very much aware of, uh, that's in the film hustle. I said, well, I actually have, I have an interview book there already, but yeah, <laughs> she's, she's a big fan and listens all the time. Kristen Schrader. I don't know. Yeah, no, yeah. She, she emailed yeah. me the other day. She emailed me the other day. She's like, yeah, yeah. You know, we're a big fan. I'm like, that's, it's always crazy when I hear things like that. Cause I'm just a dude 
Burbank. <laughs> Listening to, I'm, I'm, on, I'm, on I'm your neighbor. I'm, I'm your neighbor. I'm in NoHo. I'm looking at the Burbank Mountains out my window. Dude, you're, right li- there. you're literally yeah. in NoHo. You're down the street from me, dude. Oh yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm taking you for lunch. Yeah. Oh, we're going. Now. Yes, I'm, I'm, there's no question. I, uh, Real yeah, quick. I'm, I'm, like I said, what I was going to say too is, you know, but you, you, I do want to thank you because you provide this outlet and you provide, cause even, you know, I'm, I'm a filmmaker that's made a handful of features and all this stuff, but like, I love podcasts like yours because you can never, you can never be harmed by having a motivating voice in your ear <laughs> and hearing other people's struggles and that kindred spirit. And, and, and your podcast is, is one of the best, if not the best out there in the voice oh, of independent film. I appreciate and I say it. that as an actual longtime listener and not just trying to, uh, to kiss up cause I'm well, you're ready. You're, up, we're, we're almost done with the interview. It's over. You yeah, don't know, need you to kiss up, up at this point. Kiss up at the beginning. Yeah. You're doing <laughs> it backwards. <so. laughs> But yeah, I, keep 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 it up. Every I, everything you're doing is great. It is is wonderful. Yeah. I appreciate that, brother. I really do. Uh, I have to ask you a question: Is the, is it a world premiere? Is it a North American premiere or a U.S. premiere for dances with films? It would be the West Coast premiere because we already premiered in uh, Wisconsin. Yeah. All right, so I have to so I have to tell you my dances with films story, and I'm gonna have to call. I'm gonna call out dances with films. I'm sorry. I'm gonna call them out. Sorry, because, Michael. Yeah. Um, because uh, you see, you never piss off somebody with a podcast. I mean, this is what this is why. <laughs> no, I'm actually yeah. good. I've been invited by a, a friend of mine uh, who has another movie premiering there. So I'm gonna probably be at Dances with Films, uh, just hanging out. Uh, okay, and I've got I've got tickets for you. You're free June 18th. To come see our screening. Yeah, I'm 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 thinking about it because yeah, now that yeah. you're in there, I'm like, well, I have two. I know two filmmakers there, so at least yeah. I, I might go. But with my first feature, this is Meg. I submitted to Dances the Films, and we I went all the way to the end, and I said, like, I got accepted into Cinequest. And I'm like, look, I've already – Cinequest is up north. It's in San sure, Francisco. Yeah, you yeah guys, I was there a couple of years ago with a short. Right. So yeah. you guys could get the L.A. premiere. Like it's – I mean I'm going to be yeah. able to bring everybody out from L.A. It had a lot of Hollywood stars in it. Yeah, yeah. It had – you know, I can you know motivate the tribe to head out and check out this film that they, I've been talking about. And, at the, and they literally took it to the last second. And they finally said, because it's not the West Coast premiere, we can't do it. And I'm like, uh, you son of a bitch. <laughs> so from unless uh, unless otherwise, I shall never submit. No, I'm joking. No, uh, good I'll, festival. I'll, I'll share. I should find. We have. I have an email where you know I submitted. We got the thing back. Said, uh, I'll, I'll use kinder language. Why would you premiere your film oh, there yeah. and, oh. instead of instead of oh, with yeah. us? Oh, it's we, brutal. We, it's we, brutal. We really prefer world premieres and I, I wrote back something to the effect of like slow down Sundance uh, you know <laughs> it would still be the West Coast premiere I said and I and I countered I said have you because at that point it's like if they don't want the film I said you know but have you ever seen a film shot in a single take with two camera crews in two different parts of a city that was scored live in a single take probably not so I think we're still be interesting to your audience yeah, yeah and that's the kind of way that's that only you can only say that once you have a, a, a few uh a few pieces of shrapnel in you from from your working in the business so oh yeah 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 you you learn it once you once you toughen up and don't fear the industry anymore think opportunities open up a lot more because because when you live we all live in fear of like well we can't we have to be polite to everybody no this is this is my whole thing when when i uh I mean, I, I could go on forever, but because there are a lot of film festivals that like should not be film festivals because yes. they don't do anything to draw people out. You know, you, you spend all that money to fly across the country and buy a new tie and rent an Airbnb. Can I, and then, can I, can I and call out no a festival? There. Can I never call out festivals? I have to call out a festival. And this is the sure. only festival I've ever done this with. Yeah. I do it constantly. The LA Shorts Film Festival. Stay away. I've Anyone who listens, it, I've never been part of it, but yeah. LA Shorts Film Festival. Everyone stay away from that festival. The reason why is because exactly what you did. I flew out from Florida. I came yep. out there. I had guys. I knew guys that were flying from Spain, from Spain, to do their short blocks. Such disrespect. No Q and A. When we asked, they were just like, "Get out." And I'm like, "Wow." And that was in 2005. Fast forward a few years, it's, but there's and I still these, call them know, out. <laughs> It's a lot of people like a lot of, and I believe that most of the people starting these small film festivals have the best of intentions, Yeah. but if they don't, if they're not marketing and bringing, if it's only, it's, it's all that Saturday night live sketch with the, the film festival you saw with Emily Blunt, where like was the film, oh, uh, the oh, film was... ends and they're like everybody who's part of the film and everyone in the audience gets up <laughs> except for one person. You know, it's like, like I can play to my friends and family at home. I don't need to come to spend money to go to a festival. But my point is that it's, it's great that film, film freeway now has, I mean, Film Freeway over without a box is brilliant to begin yes, with, yes. but they have the review 
the review thing. Have you ever read anything that was less than a five star review of a festival on there? No. It's Shocking. all fil- it's all of us filmmakers that like live in fear of not being invited back again by being honest about, you know what? No one showed up to my screening. This happened. We weren't given a Q and a, yeah. they shut my film off while the credits were halfway. Yeah. They wanted to clean the Cinequest screwed us. We had a short there and there was a weird flicker problem with the projector. And instead of stopping it and fixing it, it wasn't our DCP. It worked fine. They didn't stop it and restart it. They just let the entire 15 minute short play that way and didn't offer an apology or anything. And it I was, I, yeah, I was close to kicking the projection booth door down and stopping the projector. But yeah, it's, it's, those stories are everywhere. But I think, I think we need to, as filmmakers, be less afraid because the more honest we are and the more yeah. we all speak up, then it will help improve these festivals. Yeah. Because the, because the great festivals are the ones that, you know, um, even when we were at Beloit, Beloit was wonderful few like i'll call them technical imperfections it's just you know, it's a festival where the venues are less traditional venues you're sometimes sure. in a like party room at a big restaurant or something so you like there's things where the sound could be tweaked or, or things just aren't set sure, up sure sure but they the programmers were wonderful you would suggest things like that they'd be like how do we do that let's call someone in and fix that immediately so it doesn't happen to any other screenings like you know there there it's not to say that it's a, it's a it's an all out evil across the board it's no, just no it's a, there's a lot of know. good film festivals i mean i always promote the holly shorts because i think they're one of the greatest uh, there i've not played there but i've i've been to plenty of screenings it's wonderful yeah. they're a wonderful wonderful uh, festival and and there's a lot of festivals that i've gone to that i recommend uh, tremendously but i think it's you're right i think we got to call out you know bad experience and look I had a really great experience at Cinequest. You didn't. It happens. Yeah. You know. I mean, I'm sure other the festivals- rest of the festival was phenomenal. It was it's just the just actual you. presentation it of our film. Cinequest, I think it was, per- is, I think it was I mean, personal Cinequest because you were Canadian. Hair or there? Yeah, probably. I mean, it's because you were but Canadian. I, that's why. But we shot it in L.A. and I lived in L.A. already. It doesn't no, matter. They, to, they can uh, smell it. They can smell it. <laughs> they were. I mean, what what a festival in terms of taking care of their filmmakers and like mm-hmm. like open bar all day in the filmmaker lounge. Like mm-hmm. it was. It's uh, no, they're good. Yeah, it, it was wonderful. We we went the year that would have been 2016. It was the year that they lost their theater downtown was being yeah, renovated. I know, and they went, that's the year that I went. It was 2015. Like shuttle, is when it, oh, so you had the shuttle bus where I had to go back and forth between because they they had the theater somewhere else. But even that, they would make sure that everybody everybody was taken care of and had a way had a way to get everywhere. It's just it was awesome. And so, I, that's the, the same thing. Same with the Beloit Festival. I can't say enough. It, you know, it's a it's a smaller Midwest festival, but man, the audiences were great. The engagement with the film was great. They they would give every every single filmmaker a personal driver to get you to and from. They take you like on cheese factory tours if I'll you t- wanted whatever you well, wanted. They took care some, of you. You need some cheese factory tours. <laughs> I mean, why wouldn't you? But the thing is, also I've noticed is that some of the smaller festivals or mid range festivals they do take care of their film fe- filmmaker, especially if they're not like L A. Or not like New York. If they're in a small town, they're just ex- the, the whole town is excited about the festival. Absolutely. It's a thing. You know, it's a real big thing, like Park City was back in the day when Sundance first started. Now they're just like, oh God. Oh, get out of here. Yeah. <laughs> all these fifty thousand people are showing only, up. All only these- the uh, only the hotel and cafe owners are excited. Everyone else is just like, Oh, I just want to get to work and home. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, but yet sometimes those smaller festivals, you do have a much, much better experience because they're just so much more excited to have you. Uh, than some of these bigger festivals, or you might fall uh, fall yeah. to the wayside. But anyway, like so you could, generally you can never go wrong. You're always going to meet another actor or filmmaker, somebody that you want to work with and collaborate with, or pick up new tips about making films or marketing films. Like you can always sponge great information from even terrible experiences. Oh, um, absolutely. So there's always value in that. Um, but at the same time, if you could save a grand and you know put that towards your next film or buy some Facebook ads to get people to watch your film online instead of 16 people in a mostly you know empty theater at midnight this, in some poduck town uh, that would also be great to know in advance yeah. this is uh this is a this is a whole other podcast i think we could yeah, actually yeah. do an entire just you and me bitching about film festivals and our experiences a, a film festival podcast where we review festivals you know <laughs> could you imagine we'd, that would we'd be, be like amazing. the it would be like that South Park episode about Yelp reviewers where they're like, oh, we got to give them the best table because they're just going to give us a bad review if they don't. Uh. <laughs> we got to let them in. We got to let them in. If not, we're not going to get any submissions. So that's I think that's the next thing. You and I become those guys. And then all the time. And then when we have movies, we call them up. If we don't get in. <laughs> You won't get any submissions this year. So, uh, hey, it's uh, it's Alex and Gavin. Yeah, we're the guys shooting that documentary about film festivals. So, uh 
Yeah, I'm just going to email you. What's the waiver code? Okay, yeah, thank okay, you. Thank you. <laughs> A, anyway, anyway, all right, let's finish it off because I know we could, you and I, I feel that we could talk for at least another five hours about stuff. Yeah. Um, all right, so these are the questions I ask all my guests, and you should sure. know them. There might be a few new ones you haven't heard, but let's see. All right, all right. What advice would you give a filmmaker wanting to break into the business today? Pick up whatever camera you have and go make your first short. Stop sitting on the couch saying, I got to wait till I can afford a red cam. Oh, I've got to learn more about lighting. Oh, I don't know any actors. Go find your local theater company. Go to the local college that has an acting problem. Do whatever it takes to get off your ass right now and make a film. Don't worry if it could be better. It's always going – there's always the scenario it could be better. Just go make stuff. Put it on YouTube. Do whatever it takes to establish yourself and get in the game because all it's going to do is excite you to keep going. But if you don't ever get it over that first hump – and, you know, social media exists. Go on go on Facebook. Every city has its own, like, I need a producer kind of Facebook group where you can go in and you can be very honest and say, I don't have a budget. I'm looking for other people starting out. Let's get together and meet, meet for coffee and figure out how to – and go volunteer on other people's sets. If you expect people to volunteer on yours, just – Every person you know making films, go offer to do anything. Be the driver. Be the guy watching the gear in the truck. It doesn't have to be glamorous. Just go network because those people in your city, wherever you live, making content, they should be your inspiration and they will gladly repay a favor when you're ready to make your first project. Uh, yeah, without question. Now, can you tell me what book had the biggest impact in your life or career? Oh, yes. Uh I see many of them in the back. I see many of them. Yeah, yeah, story, yeah. story pops right out, but that's always the one that's in everybody's yeah. shelf. It's uh, how, how to make a movie for under $10,000 and not go to jail. Oh, what movie? Uh, oh, I never heard of that book. author is oh, – where is it? Brett, uh, Brett Stern is the author. It was, the first one that I, it was the first one that I read where it was like – it was very real advice. It wasn't just like, here's the technical way and here's how you break down a budget. There's a chapter in there like, okay, here's like a recipe for stew that will feed people for three days and you can return into the soup the next day instead of buying everyone's Subway or burgers that's going to cost you this much money. Or now you're in the editing phase. This is where you hate everything. You hate yourself. You're not going to shower for days. Your girlfriend's probably going to leave you. Like It was just very like real world advice about what to expect and emotionally anticipate making a film, but also how to practically do it and cut through all the fat and you can make a movie for 10 grand if you want to. So that was one of the best. Yeah. I'm and then Bruce uh, on the show. Oh uh, yeah. Uh, so it's, it's, is it Bruce or uh, Brett, Brett, Brett Stern? Yeah. He, um, if he doesn't have an indie film podcast, he should, because he's one of those guys. Just, and that book's been around for years. I read that probably 15 years ago. And then of course, uh, rebel without a crew. Yeah, of course. I actually, I actually read that and said, you can't make a movie as one person. So I went out, I took seven grand and said, I'm going to go make a movie f by myself as the only crew person. And I did it. I made a whole feature that way. I'm like, all right, he wasn't, he wasn't BSing. You can actually do it if you want to do it. Um, yeah. And I, it's funny, all those ones, I, I sort of, uh, those are the books I always lend out, never come back kind of thing. Mm -hmm. When I moved to LA, I went down, Santa Monica has, I think it's just called Bookworm or Book. Mm -hmm. there's, a, there's a great little used bookstore there. And I was like, oh man, I can rebuy all the books that I read before I'd ever made a movie and reread them again and see like, see how much information actually like stuck with me or I thought it'd be a good, so I'm sort of revisiting all those books. Nice. Nice. Now, what is the lesson <clears throat> that took you the longest to learn, whether in the film business or in life? Oh boy. Um, le let go of ego <laughs> and not, not worry about outside criticism or feedback because you can't avoid it. And there's no reason to have an ego in this industry. Um, this is my, my latest one is, is unless you have a name or, or something behind you where people will recognize your name, don't put a film by Gavin Booth on your poster. I laugh, let know that it's not just me. I can guarantee it, but I laugh my ass off at festivals all day long when I look at posters and it's like a film by, and I, I loudly just point out and go, who, who is that? Like, that is a credit reserve for people whose name have achieved greatness in terms of critical success or is a marketing tool and will actually help sell tickets. The ninth film by Quentin Tarantino, <laughs> a Steven Spielberg film. That means something to selling tickets. John, John Anthony 
you know, John Anthony Stewart from Chicago's second film, it doesn't mean anything. So let so, the film and the film art and the story sell your film. And I was, I, I was like that. I was like, oh, it's just what everybody does. You put your name on everything. You brand everything. Um, and the same with music video directors. Stop putting your oh, that's, directed yeah. by credit at the beginning of the video. Like it's a, it's a, it's all part of the social media things that I, the, the Instagram age of just self-importance that I just let go of your ego, make the work, be proud of what you made, regardless of nobody else is proud of it. <laughs> fair enough. Fair enough. Now, what is the biggest fear you ever had to overcome for making your films? Uh, Ooh, I think believing that my stories are worthy of calling on, let's call them like bigger or, or, more established people to get involved with them. Mm-hmm. When you sit there and say, <laughs> Oh man, this would be a great role for this actor. Or, man, I really love this cinema, the cinematographer's work, but I, I could never afford, they'd never come do something indie. When I started sneaking into events and meeting people, you realize everybody wants to make creative projects. And if you have something interesting, you might just hit them at the right time, yep. the right place in their career where they go like, Oh wait, you only need me for three days phenomenal. I'll cut my rate. I'll come do that. Don't fear anything because it's it's exactly like dating. The worst that girl or guy or the person you're attracted to is going to say is no. And it sucks. Rejection will never stop sucking. But if you're in the film industry, you're already looking at a lifetime of rejection. So what's <laughs> one? Just, <laughs> just go great. for it and ask. Like, believe that your script is, is good enough or believe that this little thing that you, if you believe in it that hard, other people will as well. So just, I had to get over that fear of like, Oh, I could never get an agent in LA. Like I'm not, I'm not there yet. Or like, or, Oh, I, I don't know if I should call Blumhouse about this live film. It's, it's just, it's such a tiny little weird project and nobody's ever made a live film before. If I, if I had lived with that, you know, if I had not gotten over my fear and I, and I still have those fears, of course, you know, mm-hmm. self doubt and fear like are, are riddled through every filmmaker. It's, prerequisite. Much, it's a prerequisite. I don't care how big your ascot is and your sunglasses. You're riddled with fear and fear of rejection. I don't. I don't have my ascot yeah. with me. Not today, you. Sir. Not you. No, not today, sorry. sir. Not today. Hey, not today, yeah. sir. But <laughs> just short aside, my 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 wife's uh, grandmother when when I first met her said, "Oh, you're a director. Does that mean you have to wear one of those neck scarves when you're on TV giving interviews?" And I spit my drink out of the restaurant and 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 died laughing because I was just like, oh, it's so she's so correct, she's so correct. Oh no, that's that's better than what my my wife my mother in law said when I first <laughs> met her, when I, when she first heard that I was in the film business. Like they're all oh, on no. drugs. They're all on drugs. On drugs. <laughs> they're all on drugs. They sleep around. They don't like. I'm not like a soap opera star like in South America. Like <laughs> you, gotta get, you gotta get really famous before people start offering you like free drugs and stuff. I mean, if you can't afford to make an indie film, you can't afford a cocaine habit. Those are, I, that's a pretty easy uh, accounting summary. I've, uh, I've never been offered uh, cocaine. Not yet. I, I haven't gotten to that level yet until I get offered. I, I have through drugs. the music industry. Several, oh, I'm an imagining. Of course. Several you're in the dozen music. times. Um, <laughs> But yeah, yeah, it's a it's 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 a life it's a lifestyle that costs a lot more than trying to be an indie filmmaker. So several yeah. life <laughs> just several to worry thousand, about. several thousand times I've been offered. <laughs> yeah, you should just sniffle a lot around her, and you know <laughs> they'll be fine. It'll be oh, he's good, he's good. I don't, I'm good. I just had a, I had one. Yeah. Um, so all right, three of your favorite films of all time. Uh, original Star Wars, hands down. Um, of course, e, e, Run Lola Run. Because at the time, film. it was the most inventive film. It was still one of the most inventive films it was I've ever. Film. Love that movie. And uh, and then the movie that I've watched the most in my entire life, Stand by Me. Oh, so uh, good. Any any great like coming of age story like that? Those those are the three films I've probably seen the most in my life. Out, out of dozens of others that I that I love, those those are the three that are the most rewatchable for me. And where can people find you? Uh, you can find me, I deleted my Twitter. I got sick of, uh, politics and you couldn't avoid it, but you can find me Facebook. It's, uh, Gavin Michael Booth. I, I have a page that I don't really check, but if you ever want to reach out or collaborate or I can share any advice or war stories, you can just careful, find me on careful, my personal page. Careful. And then, careful. Oh yeah. Oh, I love it. I'll <laughs> chat anybody I can ever help out with. I'm sure you're inundated. You got, you need a whole careful. separate email channel just for the, the requests. Careful. Um, I've, I've had other guests say things like this I, I, and they warrant, they call me after like, I had no idea what you were going to do to me, Alec. I'm like, Hey, no, I'm, I'm, I'm ready for it. I'm ready. <laughs> I, that's the thing. Like I, I might've made some films, but I also, I want to meet all your other listeners and I want to collaborate with everybody in some way or shape or form. And then just Gavin, Michael 
that's where you can find uh, some of my past short films, trailers for anything, and and a bunch of the music videos I've made. Oh man, this is oh, been- and, and, and Instagram, of course, uh, at Gavin Michael Booth. Yeah. Man, awesome. Gavin, it has been an absolute pleasure talking to you, brother. It has been great. I feel like we're kindred spirits, and uh, and we're well, and we- I know that we're neighbors. I, I'm going to take you for lunch and take you to the void, so you can come be a stormtrooper oh, with I- me. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, as you see my life-size Yoda in the background, you know, I, I rolled yeah, that way. So absolutely. It's, it's, unfortunately, it's an episode one Yoda, but I'll let that go. Hey, you know what? Go. Listen, do you have a life-size Yoda in your room? No. No. No, you this, don't. This is, this is a fair point. But I'll you know what take I will any have Yoda. You know what have I will to- have tomorrow? A custom-made what? lightsaber from Galaxy's Edge. What? Okay, so now we're going to have to throw our uh, – <laughs> our our Star Wars uh, uh you know what's on the table, and um, our manhoods are going to have to be slapped on the table. Our Star Wars manhoods yeah. will have to be slapped on the table. I w- I have back there, which not many people can see, but I have an autographed Star Wars lunchbox by George Lucas, who Amazing. I met who I met in Toluca Lake when he had lunch with his uh, daughter right next to my old offices, and it was during the time he was selling. Disney. So it was before the Disney sale. Yeah, yeah. So that's why he was in town. Because I'm like, why is George Lucas in like Toluca Lake? Why is he here? Yeah. And then like a month later, Disney buys. I'm like, that was he was there for the meeting. So that's what I have in the background. That generally trumps a lot of. So you you had a Star Wars lunchbox in your office, just no, like better. The be- <laughs> no, the better, better, better than that. The story is this, and I swear this is the way it happened. You stole it from I, a child. No, I well obviously, but no. <laughs> I ordered a Star Wars lunchbox from Amazon because I'd always wanted a Star Wars lunchbox that like, you know, just put it in my office. Yeah. Yep. It arrived that morning. And I would have taken it home when I went to lunch, but it was there in the three hour window that the George, George Lucas, Lucas was, was there. and I, I had auto- and I had autograph pens because I had my clients autograph posters and stuff for my walls yeah. and stuff. So I was just like it was just literally and he never autographs. So it was actually his daughter who said, "Dad, just just sign it, just sign yeah. it." And he was like, "All Amazing. right." And and I told him, "Make it out to me, because I'm never selling this." That's and amazing. That's so there, great. but I would do would like a custom uh, lightsaber. That would be kind of cool. I'll, uh, if they if they weren't two hundred dollars each, I'd grab one for you while I was there. You know, <laughs> isn't it isn't it tough? Isn't it tougher? Like with the wife, just says like, "Babe, you know, I think I need a I think I need a life size uh, Yoda. I think I, I need." <laughs> We're pretty good because you know she the amount of acting classes and things that she does to better her career. Then I I go like I feel good to be like I want, I kind of want to get the Criterion streaming channel. She's like I'm like it's ten dollars a month and she's like I pay this much for acting class every go do it like she's she's because I don't buy a lot of memorabilia anymore. When we sure. moved from Canada here, we sort of like I got out of the habits of collecting DVDs oh, yeah. and Blu-rays. And so so I technically save us a fortune every year. You know there's <laughs> I still that's, subscribe, that's a sales I pitch. subscribe to. She thinks I'm insane for still subscribing to Entertainment Weekly, but I try to remind her that when I was in high school, the internet didn't exist. And yep. getting Entertainment Weekly, that was the that was- Bible of like what movies were coming out, what what was happening, what people were doing. And there's just some – there's that nostalgia in me. I like to read it every week when it comes to sit down and read it instead of reading it. I could read it on my iPad. I could get Apple News Plus. But wow. some things are just – you know whatever you grew up with, you, 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 you should have that love. I mean you know sitting on my desk, I've got uh, – Blockbuster, please be kind. Oh, for a look at just, that! Just to remind, me. Just just to remind you of your of your it. of your roots, sir. Of your roots. Yes, yes, yeah. <laughs> I look at that every day while I edit. Yeah, <laughs> sir. It has been an absolute pleasure, brother. Thank you so much uh, for coming on the show and dropping some knowledge bombs on how to shoot a one take or two one take two one take two person. Uh, one take split screen double shot something or other there's a lot of work just everybody go see last call whenever you can find it in your area thanks again brother i appreciate it happy to be part of the tribe thank you so much for such an entertaining conversation gavin thank you again for coming on the show and dropping the knowledge bombs on the tribe man so thank you again so so much if you want links to Gavin's film, Last Call, how to get in touch with Gavin, anything we talked about in this episode, please head over to the show notes at IndieFilmHustle.com forward slash 344 for the show notes. And guys, a few weeks ago, I said there was going to be another big announcement after I launched FilmTrepreneur.com and all the things I did with the book and everything else that's going on. But I have another big announcement coming either later this week or by the latest next week. And it's going to be a doozy. It's something that you guys have been asking for forever. And it's something that I finally have gotten around to do it. And I really hope it's great for you guys in the tribe and for any filmmaker that's going to be 
finding about, out about it. I hope it helps. I know I'm being cryptic. I'm sorry. <laughs> you know me. You know what I like to do. I like to keep you guys in suspense. But you know what? I never disappoint. I, I truly try never to disappoint when I do something like this. So more stuff coming. I've got more announcements coming down the line, but this is a pretty big one as well. So keep an eye out for that. And real quick, guys, before we finish, I wanted to kind of talk a little bit about last week's episode on predatory film distributors. As you know, and it's by, by your response, it's a very popular topic. And a lot of uh, filmmakers are really interested. A lot of members of the tribe are really interested in that episode. And thank you so much for all the responses, all the stories that I'm getting from filmmakers. I want to put this out there. If you guys have had, <laughs> I'm afraid to do this, but if you guys have had a bad you know, situation, if you've had a bad experience with a film distributor, email me your story. Email me what happened at ifhsubmissions at gmail.com. This, I feel, again, as I said last week, is a moral issue. It is a big problem in this industry. It's kind of like when, you know, everybody knew about the casting couch and it took a big event to finally break that open. And, and the casting couch was just something that everyone understood, knew, it happened, and just ignored. And I feel that these distributors, these predatory distributors are, are, you know, there's no light shined on these bastards. So I want to use my platform. I want to use Indie Film Hustle. I want to use the power of the tribe to focus a nice, bright, shiny light on all of these distributors that are doing wrong to filmmakers and are predatory and hurting filmmakers. Because if you hurt one filmmaker, honestly, you hurt us all. Because God knows what would have happened if that filmmaker would have been successful, and but instead they left the, they left the business because they just you know they got advi- taken advantage of and they couldn't come back from the financial hit of being basically their movie stolen from them. So I, I want to I really want to focus as much energy as I can on this cause on this movement. I want if you are listening, please spread the word on that last episode as well as this episode, but on that last episode and any content that I'm going to be putting up over the next months, weeks, and months about this topic, share it because I want this information to get out there. I want filmmakers to be prepared to deal, you know, to deal with film distributors. And again, not all of them are bad, but you really need to protect yourselves because it is a brutal, brutal business. And it's something that's so, uh, it's just like entrenched in in the, in, in the system, in the business, that everyone goes, oh, you know, yeah, I got screwed by my distributor. Oh, I got screwed by my distributor. Oh, they stole money. Oh, they never paid me. Oh, they did this or did that. I've heard that story a thousand times over the course of my career, and I'm tired of it. I'm tired of it, and I want to help. So again, if you have a story about a bad experience with a film distributor or that you signed a predatory film distribution contract, and it's just, you can't get a hold of them. They haven't paid you, blah, blah, blah. Whatever the story is, send it to me. I want to re- I want to hear about it so I can better educate the tribe about these predatory film distributors, okay? Email me at ifhsubmissions at gmail.com. Thanks again for listening, guys. As always, keep that hustle going. Keep that dream alive. And I'll talk to you soon. Thanks for listening to the Indie Film Hustle podcast at IndieFilmHustle.com. That's I-N-D-I-E-F-I-L-M-H-U-S-T-L-E.com. Hi, folks. Dirk Spentley here. Being on the go is a big part of my life. I love seeing new places, meeting new people, and performing all over the world. For energy on the go, for me, it's five-hour energy. It works fast, works long, and it tastes good with zero sugar and four calories. Try it. It could work for your on-the-go life, too. Five-hour energy. Energy on the go. Get five-hour energy at your local 7-Eleven. Geico presents Yikes! Another voicemail from your roommate. Sup, roomie? Hey, a pipe burst in the basement. It's completely flooded. Anyway, I called for someone to fix it, but in the meantime, I was thinking we could finally have that indoor pool party we've always wanted. I got some cool swan floaty things already going. Could you pick up some chips on your way home? Later. 
The GEICO Insurance Agency could help keep your personal property protected. Like if your roommate isn't the brightest pool float in the flooded basement. Visit GEICO.com to see how easy it is to switch and save on renter's insurance.